Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's window company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank, Chase Commercial Term Lending. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Bingham McCutcheon, LLP, Briarwood Organization, Bruce Mosler, Capital One Bank, Cassidy Turley, C.B. Richard Ellis, Chelsea Lighting, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova Burns and Gian Tomasi, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Corman Communities, Madison Realty Capital, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Site Comply, Sterling and Sterling, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, The Wickoff Group, Urban American, and Ackman Ziff Real Estate, Aerial Property Advisors, Eastern Consolidated, Essex Capital Partners, Goldman Properties, Moynian Group, Must Development, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group, LLC, Rosewood Realty Group, Triangle Equities. So certain people grow up in New York and have such a very interesting life. Growing up in Bed-Stuy, going to, going to Yale, going to law school, how many people become, subsequently become get involved with poverty and become the president and CEO of the Community Service Corp of New York? I'm very happy to have uh, my friend David Jones today. So David, really it's interesting, as we were saying before we were reflecting on this, it's really interesting to talk about your grandfather and then your father because it has such a, a rich family history. Tell me about your grandfather who was a headmaster in Barbados. Right. right. My, my grandfather was a headmaster in Barbados, came a little after the turn of the century to New York and essentially had to recreate himself. Right. Your grandfather was married to Mabel. Who Mabel was Ward. Mabel Ward, whose and father was a, um, a, a gin... No, rum. Rum, rum, rum. rum. I apologize. So rum. he, he, uh, her father was sort of the, the major player at Mount Gay Rum, which is a very famous rum. Um, my grandfather eloped with, with uh, Mabel. And up until the 1950s, there was a total break with the family. They, they didn't forgive any of us until uh, the 50s. Um, I, I still remember the, the, the first sort of trip back. My father was invited back as a young man once and uh, was, you know, essentially uh, allowed to come to the, to the table. Now, you said to me, it's interesting, your, your grandfather, who came over here, who was a, a headmaster, tried to get a job at the old ANS in Brooklyn, I right. mean, the original Abraham and Strauss, as an elevator operator, and he was denied the job. Yeah, he and was he told he was too dark. This was still a time when we had an extraordinarily segregated city. I think uh, it, it's interesting now you don't see it. There's still echoes of it. But uh, he was literally uh, unable, despite his educational attainments. Um, he knew Greek, Latin, calculus. He was a really gifted man. And he could never really uh, sort of use those gifts. So he then goes to the um, the M. J. Lowy School of Chiropractic, uh, which was founded in 1911. So he wasn't right. he was one of the first graduates. Right. And as I was joking with you, which is not a joke, that the majority of the small class were either African Americans or Jews who were 
denied opportunities to go into health care. My grandfather was always very sophisticated, and in and, and retrospect, I mean, he understood that he had to have something to support his family quick. There, the opportunities available for uh, educated uh, black men of his time were extraordinarily narrow. It happened to be in a segregated society that uh, podiatrists uh, was one of the areas that you could keep a reserve that uh, essentially blacks often couldn't get treated uh, by anyone who, who wasn't of their race. So he targeted on that. Um, he was also at the same time uh, 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 an, an acolyte, a lieutenant uh, for Marcus Garvey, the famous uh, Marcus Garvey, who, and he was trying to create something called a trucking line that was going to link up with something called the White Store Shipping Line that Marcus Garvey was trying to do. Marcus Garvey wanted to create an entire sort of infra economic infrastructure uh, for the black community of its time, and uh, my grandfather idealized Marcus now, Garvey. Now, your father had a very interesting life. Your father was born here. Uh, right. Uh, and your father... Um, went to uh, St. John's Law School. Yep. Subsequently, tell, tell me a little bit about your dad. Well, my dad, uh, you know, came along again at a time of very segregated uh, uh, New York. Uh, he was very gifted right from the beginning. He was uh, 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 clearly had always been an outstanding student uh, when he went to school and went to both undergraduate and to law school at St. John's. Um, but he was also extraordinarily politically active. Right from uh, the beginning. I mean, and the interesting situation is you said your dad and your mother uh, met at one of these organizational, let's say maybe a, a radical or whatever sure. we want to call it, and your mother was white and Jewish. Right. Uh, and uh, her family was originally, they came over from Romania, Russia. From Turkish Palestine. From Turkish Palestine. They settled in uh, Detroit, and your, your, your grandfather was... Uh, on the lines working at Ford, uh, interesting place for a Jewish guy also. Right. And your parents uh, got married when? They got married, a good question. You know, I'm not, uh, it was 1938? So this was before the war. because it was before your father, the war. Because your father in the war uh, served even later on uh, as a judge, I remember, right? right? He was uh, in the war. Well, he, he was ultimately because of his anti-fascist and progressive work, uh, drafted in 1939, uh, as a, and he was told by the draft officials that it was uh, this was, they were the retaliation, so they drafted him in those er earliest draft. I think he was one of the first. He actually served for five years in, in World War II, and he came in I think as a private and ultimately left as a lieutenant with an offer to become a captain. But he had uh, he was sent uh, you know to train ultimately train black troops in Oklahoma, one of his the great sort of family stories. Um, at that time, this was relatively early in the war, uh, they were training black troops, and uh, in the town they were near, they had some of the first uh, German prisoners of war. The townspeople said they'd accept the white Germans who were prisoners, but they wouldn't allow black troops to, to come on Sunday and Saturday. So, you know, the, the level, I think, it, it's hard to explain to another generation. It's not my generation even. I have echoes of it, but of how difficult a time it was uh, for these individuals as they struggled. Now, when your father came back uh, you, from the war, you said to me that one of the interesting situations was that your dad had met a number of uh, African-American leaders, you know, from different areas of arts. Uh, right. And one of them, we'll get to the story about Josephine Baker on right. the trip with your father. <laughs> but, um, you know, who were some of these people? Well, Paul Robeson was one of his clients uh, up until they had a, a break, a political right. break. Uh, Josephine Baker was one of his clients. Uh, Dizzy Gillespie was one of his clients. Uh, and it seems, this is uh, in some ways Zelig-like, uh, there was a very small group of African-American professionals who were emerging at that time, particularly as progressive as my father was. He was clearly, even to the, as a politician, uh, he was used as uh, the one to confront uh, powerful individuals. They'd say, let Tommy Jones confront uh, 
Wagner and Nelson Rockefeller. Right, because your father was even involved with the Henry Wallace, with the uh, with the, the Chinese. Uh, right. He, yeah, he 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 took on a case early on. Uh, this was early in his legal career when he got back from the war. Essentially, a, a group of Chinese laundry workers. This was at sort of the height of the McCarthy period had been sending back uh, cash pay, uh, pay packets to their families, and they were indicted uh, f and on federal charges of trading with the enemy. And ultimately, no lawyer in New York would touch this case, and uh, my father represented the, the, the members of this uh, Chinese laundry uh, all the way up to the Supreme Court, actually. Now, before we, now we're going to have to get to you because I've yeah. spent a lot of time. But the interesting situation is that your dad subsequently ran for city count uh, for assembly, right, and was elected to assembly, and then subsequently became a judge, right. Okay, and we'll get to that. So you're born in Bed Stuy, right, uh, and you went to public school originally, and right. subsequently you went to um, Brooklyn Friends, uh, um, and ultimately left there and went to a place called Elizabeth Irwin. Uh, which was sort of the, the most radical of the uh, high schools of its time. Uh, uh, you know, Angela Davis went to, you know, the, uh, you know, uh, Guthrie's kids went there. A whole range of sort of the progressives of its time went to this so, place. So you graduated high school when? What year? 1966. And you decide to go to uh, where? Wesleyan. Wesleyan University basically because this, this was just at the edge of active recruiting uh, by colleges to get a more diversified uh, group of young people. Um, I was, got into the University of Chicago. I still had an application into Harvard. But Wesleyan actually sent the, the dean of admissions, a guy named Dean Hoy, down to see me personally. And I had never heard of Wesleyan, I, uh, you know, but it essentially, what their commitment was, they weren't just taking uh, one or two African Americans, they brought in a whole class of us. And that was really the ultimate, I mean, it had cachet, but it was really about knowing you were gonna be in an environment that was gonna be somewhat supportive. And that's, that turned out to be true. Uh, that's still sort of part of the, the right. history of so, Wesleyan. So you had the four years of Wesleyan. You were telling me one time you, when you were growing up, you were working for the Merchant Marine? Yeah, in 19, when I was 16 years old, essentially because of a c contact my father had, what was happening in this time, uh, the NMU, the National Maritime Union, uh, used to actively go after high school students to serve on summer cruises and ships because their, their permanent uh, members were fearful that if someone came in who was an adult or you know, not going back to school, they might take their job. So they recruited dozens of us to go on some of the major ships. I went on the SS Constitution and the SS United States. And for a 16-year-old, I, I still remember the scene. My mother dropped me off at uh, 4 in the morning in Hoboken, and she was terrified. But it was a great experience for somebody who had been rather sheltered. Um, and it, it was transformative in some ways. I got to see. Now, you graduated Wesleyan in what year? I graduated in 1970. Now, while you're at Wesleyan, you're able to, you got the Thomas Watson? Yeah, uh, fellowship. Fellowship. Tell me about that. This was, I think it was only the second year. The Watson Fellowship was based, it was Watson of IBM. He had the idea that people should be exposed to, to a year abroad, studying abroad. And you got a lump sum you had to apply of what you were going to study, and then you were on your own, and you pre presented a paper at the end of it. Uh, for me, it was terrific. They, I couldn't take it immediately because at that point, much different from now, I had gotten into Yale Law School, and I was told that if I didn't take, come immediately, I'd have to reapply. And So you spent, Yale was three years. Yeah. Okay. What year did you take the Watson? I took the, the Watson in 71. I went to the first year of law school, took a break. This was the class with uh, 1973. Was Interesting the class. class. With, yeah, it was Hillary and and who else? Bill, and you had some and others. Bob Reich, and Lonnie Guineer, and a, a whole bunch of us, and Clarence Thomas. This was again. Uh, other people say, "Oh, you knew what was going on." We had no idea what was going on. But this was a great experience for you. The Watson it gave right. you exposure around the world. Now, during when you were at Yale, you 
get a summer job at this great white shoe firm we'd call. Yeah, I, again, I, this, this, because I had been an intern just before Senator Kennedy was killed in 68, um, I had been his intern down in Washington. So I was a second year student at college. And it was with a whole, it was only four people who were the interns of that time. I know Bob Reich and Whitney Young's daughter and myself. And we had worked uh, with Adam Walensky and Peter Edelman, basically, but you know, it was, it was an odd group. There, Mary Jo Kopechny was the chief. It was, who know that things were gonna turn out as they did. And I had done a lot of the work in the Kennedy office around um, essentially uh, military matters. So when uh, people were having difficulty with their child's assignment, they would call the senator, that was my portfolio. I also had a group of academics who sort of worked for me as an intern. I barely could get out of my own way uh, because uh, Senator Kennedy had such a broad reach that interns really had a couple of people at Harvard. Now, the interesting it. thing, which I failed to say, is how you met Senator Kennedy because it was your father right. who was a little rebel rouser and what he say to... Uh, I don't think he'd, he'd accept little rebel rouser. I think he would want it bigger than that. Um, my father had, had left the bench. This, remember, we had major riots in Bed-Stuy and Crown Heights and Harlem and Rochester in 64. Um, the senator came in, I think he was running, and was doing sort of tours of inner cities. And it was sort of, um, uh, there used to be a name for this, uh, you know, you show up, you take a couple of photographs, show the poor people, and you move on. My father uh, essentially led a group that confronted him, saying, please don't bother coming and patronizing us like this. Uh, if you're serious, do something about it, and, you know, we'll work together. And I think my father thought that was the end of it. He had done what he had done to Nelson Rockefeller and to Wagner and the rest. He had made the statement that people wanted to hear. But Kennedy followed up. Yeah, Kennedy immediately followed up. And that really became the, the, the basis of something called Bed-Stuy Restoration, which was the senator's prototype for economic redevelopment in poor neighborhoods. And it was a quite a tumultuous, I still remember uh, people got so upset as, as the thing started to shape up. I was home with my mother and a group who didn't like what was happening broke down the door of our house on Dean Street. And <laughs> I mean, I... Let's get to, yeah. you graduate law school. Right. And how did you decide to go to Cravath? I didn't go immediately to Cravath. Uh, you became a judge, you worked I, for a judge. Yes, I became a, a, a law clerk for Constance Baker Motley. And she was sort of an icon in, a, in her own right. She had been one of the chief deputies for Thurgood on Brown v. Uh, Board of Education, a really brilliant jurist in her own right. It had been the first uh, African-American uh, borough president. Uh, she had uh, then become a federal judge and had to be one of the hardest working human beings I've ever met. I think uh, there's no question. She worked a seven day week, 10 hour day and expected all her clerks to do that. I must admit I was not her best clerk. <laughs> but she was, you know, really dedicated to the work. And so there are two clerks that they take on. So I worked as a clerk for her for a year and ultimately went on from there to be a first year associate at uh, Cravath, Swain and Moore. Uh, again, I had been recruited, as I was saying, somewhat because there was a guy named Roswell Gilpatrick there, but also a guy named, who's still around, F.A.O. Schwartz, Rich Schwartz, were both the ones who recruited me into Cravath. And it, it was sort of the game plan that uh, you know we had talked about. I wanted to go learn the law, but then go into public service. I hadn't expected not-for-profits to be involved, but bouncing back and forth between the law and public service and potentially running for office were, were what right. we envisioned. But one of the things that you said uh, why you really decided that you didn't want to run for office was your father running around and the tuna casseroles, uh -huh. and it was a difficult thing running for public Well, my father really believed in it. If you take this seriously, it means that every Saturday, every Sunday evening, you sit in the church basements uh, waiting to speak and talk 
And a lot of this is not glamorous at all. A lot of this is real drudgery. And my father took it more seriously, I think, than virtually anyone else I've seen. Uh, maybe Chuck Schumer comes close if you've watched Chuck. But he was obsessed with this work. And basically the times I got to see him, he used to take me out of school when he was in the assembly, and I used to be his page. And I remember having all these discussions with so, uh, the school well, administrators. How, how did you decide to leave Corvette? There were a number of things going on. I, I had recognized I had had pretty good assignments up, up uh, for the first five or so years. Um, uh, Cravath was in the midst of the IBM litigation at that time, which was almost consuming the whole institution. And in order to be serious about it, if you really wanted to stay at Cravath, you had essentially had to go through months of training before you could even go on the IBM case. And it was requiring basically associates because this was such complex litigation that you never got into court at all. You were basically, my only court experience after five years were pro bono cases in federal court, an oral argument down in Birmingham, Alabama. This is not, if you were going to ultimately do something else, uh, I had to think about it. And there was also a difficulty that we have to recognize that the civil rights movement had sort of ebbed here. There had been a brief burst where a lot of us had been recruited uh, who were African American out of some of the best schools. And suddenly that was beginning to ebb. And so I looked around me at Cravath. There were no mentors, African American mentors. Uh, there was a real attrition rate among my peers uh, that was pretty horrific in its way. And I started to reassess. I had also taken a leave in 1976 much to the distress of my partner at the time, to work as the deputy in the Carter campaign. Right, you had mentioned that. And I worked for Bill Blanenhubel, and that was the kind of excitement I was looking for, the political action of trying to round up. This, this had happened only because Carter became um, concerned that uh, Abe Beam wasn't going to be able to properly organize the Democratic Party for him, for his election. How did you get involved with the city government? Well, in the 76 work, I, I met Ed Koch. As a matter of fact, I did some organizing with, with Ed. Uh, we got along pretty well even back then. I had also done things at the firm of organizing a mayoral debate, which uh, Ed had been part of. So that sort of passed. And so during this time, um, I had gotten to meet uh, some people who never forgave me, meet Esposito and some of the others, Tony Genovese. I began to understand some of the operatives who, uh, beyond the African-American leadership that I already knew, I began to broaden that. So suddenly, uh, it was actually part of a fight. Ed's first fight with some of the Harlem leadership, um, I get a call back at the firm. Election is over, 76, Carter wins. And uh, suddenly, I get a call from Ed Koch wanting me to come in and in interview uh, to be a special advisor. Um, after a lot of negotiation, I took over the portfolio of special advisor on, on uh, I forget what we called it, race relations, uh, the 1980 census, the whole range, federalism, we made a whole smorgasbord of it. And that really began a, a very fascinating time for me. I mean, I, I must admit, that that was perhaps the transformative period, in part because, you know, having not really felt, you know, the kind of competence you get from really being able to stand up in public and, uh, and stand before a court, I was getting concerned now that uh, did I have the kind of skill set actually to do much of anything. Uh, I could write briefs. Um, I knew I could give an oral argument. But I wasn't a full-blown lawyer yet. With five minutes left, yeah. I, I got to make sure that I, I, I mean, you were in the administration, you were in Koch, um, and I, I want to bring up a couple of things. How do you get to uh, community service? Well, <laughs> interestingly enough, so essentially I had uh, been moved from special advisor to the mayor to head of youth services at the youth board of the time. Um, at this point, and I think even Ed would admit, uh, Ed's relationship with the African American community began to deteriorate. Uh, this was uh, Jesse's Jaime Town, which uh, led Ed to be really agitated, 
this was the problems with Charlie Rangel. And I made an assessment, basically, that if I stayed too long, that ultimately I would break the very part of my constituency, would not see my, them, uh, myself as aligned with them. So I began looking. Uh, what I found was that uh, Community Service Society had been an extraordinarily troubled place. It was said to be ungovernable. It had hundred years old. hundred years, now almost 107, even older. But they were having enormous amounts of trouble. And I systematically decided that's what I could do. And then you dedicated your life to poverty, which is the major right. thing. But during that period of time, uh, health and hospitals, let's talk about that. Yeah. Uh, Carver National Bank and then the family. Well, I used, I used the, the platform of CSS to do a lot of other things. It, that was one of the nice things about it. It was totally, uh, you were able to flex with it. Uh, Carver was something that I uh, got into uh, after I went to CSS um, because it was beginning to have difficulties because it had a very old board of people in their late 70s with me on it at 39. I think the average age was still 72. That led ultimately to being chairman of Carver for five years and ultimately turning it over to Deborah Wright, who's current chairman. What about the health and hospitals? HHC was an appointment I got in the closing days of the Dinkins administration. Um, we were concerned about HHC. Um, it led ultimately to a confrontation with the Mayor Giuliani, who wanted to privatize uh, health, uh, health and hospitals. Um, we uh, used my standing as a, a board member, because the term was five years, uh, to help in a litigation uh, to try to delay that, which ultimately succeeded. Um, and the HHC environment of getting to understand how vital, particularly for blacks and Latinos and immigrants, uh, the Health and Hospitals Corporation was, was a major transformation for me. 30 seconds on your role at uh, CSS. Well, I've been there for 25 years. I think this has been um, an institution where I think we've uh, helped to uh, uh, essentially take it uh, in a direction that I think its founders would be pleased with. Uh, we've made it much more activist. We lobby, we advocate, we do academic level research on issues of poverty. Some of the achievements have been uh, our most recent work on health care. We are now the ombuds program for the entire state of New York on health care complaints on redistricting uh, for the city council right. and for nonpartisan voter registration. We've done it all. Wife and children. Okay. I have a wife, Valerie King, Dr. Was, Valerie King, was a, a clinical uh, psychologist and neuropsychologist. Uh, I have two children, uh, Vanessa King-Jones and Russell King-Jones, both well on their way, not doing what my wife and I did. Right. Your daughter is involved with fashion. She's a fashion design, a designer, an associate designer for Ann Klein. And your son? And my son works for a consulting group called Navigan up in Boston. And his wife is uh, a second, third year associate at Ropes and Gray. So I'd like to say you are truly an interesting New Yorker, and thanks for being here today. Pleasure. Thank you very much, Mike.